This is one of our most award-winning beers that we've ever made. And there's a wonderful backstory about it, and I'm not sure everyone's heard it. So, my name's Richard Norgrove. I'm Peter Kruger. And we get paid to drink for a living. It's wonderful. All right, Peter Brown, let's talk about that. Okay, way back when, in the early days of Bear Republic, if you were a new brewer or you were somebody who wanted to try to work in the brewery, I would usually ask a brewer to make a, a brown ale. Well, you say, well, what is a brown ale? Well, that, that's the whole idea, is an opportunity for a brewer to try to ex describe or explain to me what they feel a brown ale is because there's so many different styles of brown ale. Well, I had made a, a brown ale for my daughter's birth. That was Her name was Riley. We call her. Or Riley's baby brown ale. Peter Brown, who is shown on the label, um, was our million dollar salesman. And when I say that, he was the first guy who ever sold a million dollars worth of Bear Republic beer. And uh, I used to share an office with him. And uh, see, how do I tell, tell the story? But there was a day when he was in my office and he wasn't feeling very well. And I'd be in a fireman for 10 years. I told him to take go, go get himself checked. And I offered to go downstairs and grab a medical bag out of my truck, and he wouldn't listen to me, and he says, you ain't touching me, kid. And Well, long and skinny is, is Peter went home that night and had a heart attack, and I wish he had. He had He's a great guy. I wish he had actually let me, you know, check him out. So the next day, I got to come into work and try to figure out what the hell I'm going to do, and Peter had always told me that I would have a winning beer if I could take some of the elements that he loved with Big Bear, the Louisiana brown molasses that we utilize and the brown sugar, and add it to, to the brown ale. And so you know what? In his honor, I did that. And we sent it to the Great American Beer Festival, which was literally, I want to say, about four or five weeks after his death, and we won the gold medal. So here's to Peter Brown. Here's to Peter Brown. Cheers. Cheers. So in this beer, you definitely pick up the molasses and the brown sugar that are characteristics of the Big Bear. And but it's uh, just an incredibly drinkable, smooth, beautifully balanced beer, and uh, just just the way Pete liked it. You guys, it utilizes um, typical, I, I'm really in love with Centennial hops. There's Centennial and Cascade hops in there, but the hops really are not what makes this beer, um, they're not hop forward like the re remainder of our other beers. And I, I, I hate to say it, but it's very much a sleeper beer for us. It's one of those beers that finds a niche in a different market just based upon people's palates. Um, it's actually won the medals in the brown porter category. And... Um, it's just it's just a very smooth, easy drinking beer, and I really feel that that was his little touch that took it to the next level. So again, kind of keeping with other brewers within the within the brewery. Sure. So um, you guys, if you have an opportunity to try that beer, please please find it. Um, it is it is it's just a good example of a brown ale. All right. Well, cheers to Peter Brown. Cheers to Peter Brown. Yeah. All right, we're going to move on to. Um, you want to do rocket first or let's racer? Do, let's do uh, red rocket. Okay. You know we have an opportunity doing this to give you some of the backstories, but I must have brewed this beer as a home brewer. God, I don't, I, I don't even, can't even tell you. But it started out. Um, this was at that point in time in in my career as a home brewer where. Um, I was just trying to discover what different malts would, would do and tie something back to what my heritage was. And so um, my mother's Nicaraguan and my father's um, Scotch-Irish. And, and that um, kind of blending and the melding wanted me to take elements of an IPA but then make an American red ale. So this is a strong American red ale. It has its um, synergy or its relationship to Scottish-style beers, say like a shilling 90. And then it's hop like a West Coast IPA. And you know, and years ago, to say things are hop like a West Coast IPA, this was one of the first beers that you could say was in that West Coast genre because literally, you know, Cascade Centennial Chinook. Mm -hmm. And um, 
But And just a little story about my first experience with the Red Rocket. Uh, I tasted this beer in, uh, in 1996, right when the brew pub opened. Uh, I was running a brew pub in Salt Lake City, and I, I, my folks live here in Sonoma County. I came back home. We, my folks said, let's go to this new brew pub. We came up to Bear Republic, and I tasted Red Rocket. And, and I remember distinctly my dad said, well, what do you think? I said, this beer is incredible. It's over the top. It is so hoppy and so balanced and delicious. And he said, well, do you think they'll make it? I said, I don't, I don't think people are ready for this beer yet. But fortunately, I was wrong, and it's, it's turned out to be a really uh, great seller for us. Um, Rich, you want to talk about how this was the best uh, product at the, uh, the bike oh, show? Gosh. So years ago, uh, there's there's a fun backstory from how I got into the beer industry, and we won't talk about that today. But I worked for Salsa Cycles, and I was part of their operations manager, and I used to do flip-offs, uh, which was their their quick release bike product. And Ross would allow us to work after hours um, and and do different projects. Well, he was very much. He knew how much I loved the making of homebrews, and so to cultivate that spirit, he um, offered that I make this as uh, mm -hmm. kind of a giveaway at a trade show, and we did it. And it was, it was, you could walk up to our booth, and if you knew who we were and what we, had, you'd been a good customer of Salsa, you gave us this uh, password, Swordfish, and I would give you one of my homebrews. And and these were these were our customers that were buying our special custom mountain bikes. Well, it just so happened that that found its way to a couple riders and people were excited about it. And The first real publicity I ever got for Red Rocket was that this was like the best underground thing at the Interbike Bike Show way back in the in the 90s. So that helped me kind of want to grow and be what we're doing today. So I thought this would be Bear Republic's flagship, but the market determines what what really is the beer of choice for people and I would love to sell more of this but I do have I do know there are people who just really love this beer and for me it'll always have a place because that's where the Bear Republic started so the whole yeah and it's a beautiful it's a beautiful mix of uh, a lovely rich malt character it's got a, a phenolic malt character that really sets off the the, the hops the, the the centennial and cascade hops beautifully so we use a little bit of Columbus in this also, and CTZ, as some people will, will say, and this this beer, I was so afraid for years to even want to touch where this beer is at, but it 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 now um, seems to be overshadowed by a lot of different beers with that are super hoppy, but come back to it. Give it a try. I think you guys will realize where, where we've been and where we're going. So let's talk about kind of where we're going and and maybe give you a little teaser, but... Racer 5, that's what we make. I guess everybody knows this is Racer 5, and we'll give you guys a little screenshot of what's the future. It's kind of a fun beer for us, Black Racer, and then we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, let's move into Racer 5, and we can talk about that here. Right. Racer 5, it's probably one of the best... Um, recoveries or mistakes a brewer could ever make. So when we first opened the pub, um, I used to have to used to have to wear a baseball cap to let the servers and everybody know that I was trying to be the brewmaster for the day. And it not bother me when I was brewing at the little brew house behind us here. Because people would come up and they'd ask you, where's the toilet paper or oh my God, we're out of French fries. And I and I had to focus on making beer. And so early on in those times, I, I was I had a, like a part-time assistant that was one of the bartenders that helped me out a lot, and I kept the recipes in my head a lot. And, and this is a point where I wasn't documenting things very well, and I'm glad I do now. But I had Red Rocket in my head, and I used to make a, a beer that we called House IPA, kind of because we're in wine country. The thought was is we'll have a house ale, right? You come in, and that's what most of the locals would drink, and um, here I am making the house IPA, and I had the Red Rocket formulation in my head, and I threw the hops in for Red Rocket, and it was just too much. I just couldn't. I had made a mistake. So instead of trying to pass it off as something else, I had always had this other idea in my head with different hop profiles, so I went ahead and quickly came up with a recipe, threw in additional hops on top of the Red Rocket load of hops, 
which made it extremely hoppy. Mm -hmm. And we called it uh, springtime summer ale, right? So it's SS and um, SSA, so springtime summer ale. Yeah, SSA. Well, my father thought, oh, man, that's not really a good name, SSA. I thought maybe we could tie it into SS from Chevy, you know, SS Novo, that type of super sport. So that was the first time we brewed it. And then people really dug it. They went nuts for it. And I now had to take what I had made as a mistake and recreate it. It took me about five batches before I finally came up with what the formulation that we have today for Racer 5 to kind of tone it down. But literally, the first one was too hot. And, and I had created something that people here at the pub basically demanded over the original house IPA. And here we have Racer 5. Now, I'm also race cars, big love for Speed Racer, so yeah, there's a tie-in, and if you guys, you know, there you go, so here's the Speed Racer and Racer Speed Drive. Racer. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they would like you guys to talk a little bit about the aesthetics and blending the hops from the beer. How do you select the variety? Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. that's a great question. Yeah, that was a really good question. You want to take it first? Yeah, sure. So, there, you know, as as you know, there are a lot of newer hop varieties that have just a tremendous flavor profile. But and we use some of those. But here at Bear Public, we're a big fan of what we call the four C's: Cascade, Centennial, Chinook and Columbus. Those are all tried and true hops with, tr with, with really well understood flavor profiles. And we use those in different proportions in, in basically all of our beers. And we'll add other hops in addition to that. So Racer 5 primarily is, is, is made with the four C's, but at the moment it's got seven different hops. Um, but really using those tried and true hops gives us that old, I call it the, that classic hop craft brewed flavor. Um, and uh, so the blend, the blending that P Peter's talking about, really is the way that it, the, those essences or those oils are captured in the boil. So um, a lot of brewers will have really basic. I just remember looking at old English brewers that would do recipes and they throw hops in at the beginning, and then nothing else. That'd be it. You'd get one one variable. Well. We throw it at the beginning of the boil, so 90 minutes, 60 minutes, 30 minutes, 5 minutes at the end. All of those things kind of allow the melding of different characters, so the bittering, the aromatics, all of that kind of accentuates. And, and it's our goal is that you have a full palate like overload. You go from one to the back of the mouth, the front of the mouth, and that helps with that, that blending happens in the kettle. And then you couple that with a copious dose of dry hopping. And we've spent years, and we could do a whole webinar about how the way we dry hop here at Bear Republic. But I really feel that you get the nose, but then you're also going to get the front of the mouth and the back of the mouth, and it's going to balance all the way through. So hopefully that answers the question. It, it creates really the, the, the fact that we're adding hops throughout the boil and, and dry hopping creates this, this wall of flavor that kind of just continues to roll across your palate. And uh, so it's not you're not getting hit just with the bitterness and the oil. It just coats the entire palate. So Daniel has also asked uh, if you could talk about your your profiles and what unites all of the beers into that beer. Into that. Sure. Okay. Sure. Well, all right. This is and this is um, this is really years ago we would say that we were people would say we were extremely hop forward. Well, I think. And I'm gonna I'm gonna give a nod to the boys down in Southern California. They've taken what we have always done with hops and taken it to the next level, right? And and sometimes um, they're on this razor edge as to whether or not it's hop forward or um, term I'd use when I'm coaching kids with baseball is balance, right? If you're not balanced when you swing a bat, you're you're off and you're not going to hit the ball. Well, in this case, we're trying to create this balance all the way through, the balance of the sweetness, the yeast bite, the yeast character, the water that we utilize from Sonoma County, along with hops all the way through. So maybe you can expand on it too. But that that's my yeah. rationale that makes all of our beers. There's a certain balance to them that I, makes them special. Exactly. I think Rich has hit, hit on it. Our beers are very hot, tend to be very hoppy. But they are balanced. There's a malt, malt balance there. They're not just, you know, carbonated hop, 
hop water. They're, they really have a strong malt backbone that allows the hops really to shine. And I think that's, that's really the key to our beers. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that balance, years ago, people would have said we were out of balance. But I think as, as the drinking educated public is catching up to what's happening in the beer world, we're, they're, they're finding us and then coming back to us because they realize, wow, it's not just this perfumey, oily. I mean, there's a lot of things people, brewers can do to get you to have this, this um, mono, right? I, I like to say we're in stereo. Some guys will be in mono. Yeah, exactly. And I think Racer 5, that's the comment we, we continually get about Racer 5 is it's, it's, you know, it's a hoppy beer, but it is really well balanced. The malt, malt really holds its own in that beer. So. Okay, guys. So now Daniel would like to know um, if you could talk about what too much means and how that works when you're dialing up one of your recipes. That's, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, uh, you know, too much, it, it, I guess it's, you know, we're dealing with something that is, that is subjective. It, it's beers, it's a craft, but it's also an art. So I, I think really, you know, R Richard is the, the ultimate determiner of what, what balance is. But, but we, you know, what we find is we'll, we, when we're formulating a beer, we start with a baseline, and what we, we, we add in 5 or 10% increments. And eventually we get to a point where, you know, you, you're getting that big hop kick, you're getting that roll across your palate. And the, but you're still picking up on the malt character, and it's all it's all integrated. When it goes too far, it's no longer integrated. Yeah. Peter's hit 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 explained it ex extremely well. There's a beer that we make um, as part of our IPA profile that we call Apex. And me being very much a, a, a race car driver, you think about the Apex every corner that you have to drive, and the, it, it is also the fastest way through the corner, but depending upon how you choose to play with that apex will set you up for the next corner, right? So um, trying to tie my love for racing into the way that I choose to, to do beers, I have probably the best team in America in terms of how we choose to put together recipes now. Years ago it was just me, and now I get to balance where I want to go with the palates of other brewers, uh, Peter, Roger, I mean, Bubba, you just go through the list of the guys that, that back me up, and it's wonderful. We do a, a series of beers here at the pub called Rebellion with the intention of trying to educate ourselves where we, we take one single hop, and that Rebellion series is always on tap here at the pub. So if you were to come into the pub today, you'd get at least a minimum of one, if not two, of those Rebellions. And the point behind it is, is we start with a base pale ale, something that we all know within the brewery. We designed this for us and just hope people will love the education when they come to the pub. Mm -hmm. What they get the opportunity to do is see a hop that maybe its design by the grower was supposed to be for bitterness or the design by the grower was supposed to be for aromatics or oils or whatever it would be. And we take that and we try to make it a, a, a equal meld all, all the way through. So you can taste something that may be extremely floral in its character versus something that's bitter in, bitter in its character and then get to taste it all the way through. And what that does for us is allow us to decide to blend new hops in. The latest craze in the industry is the designer hop. Who's looking for the new silver bullet? Is it going to be Amarillo, Citra, all these kind of things? And, it, and unless we have an opportunity to understand where that beer is in the apex of the corner, excuse me, that hop, we don't really understand how it's going to play into ours. So, yeah, we buy into those two. We, we've done beers with Amarillo and Citra, Apollo. We love those hops. But we also figure out how they can integrate into what we're doing. So maybe that's a good way to describe it. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, so leading into the next one then, uh, is if you could talk about the oil characteristics and, and what that constitutes for the basic profile of the beer. Yeah. Okay. Oil characteristics. All right. Well, we want to talk about myrcene. We want to talk about what do we want to talk about in terms of oil characteristics. Well, I, I mean, I think I think you know when it comes down to it, you know, humans humans are are hardwired to respond to certain flavors, and you know, so so really, what we're looking for on the oil content of, of beers is to have flavors that trigger, you know, evolutionary uh, uh, pathways to pleasure for humans. So. You know, craft beer is really uh, aggressive. IPAs and craft beer are really defined by that that citrus, 
uh, you know, the tangerine, the orange, the, the lemon, that characteristic, because that's very, you know, that, that triggers that pleasure points in the brain. So um, I, I, think, I think that when we're up, you know, when we're up in selection, first what we, do, what we do when we're looking at hops is we say, do we like this hop? And then we, we, we're not looking for a certain profile that fits our beers. We're looking for something we really like. And then we, then we fit that within our beers. And, you know, I, I really believe that, that that flavor is really is we're, we're, the reason people respond to craft beer really from a very, you know, it doesn't take a lot of training to appreciate a craft beer is because those are, those are things that people are historically, you know, evolutionarily uh, well, they're drawn, yeah, they're they're drawn, drawn to. It. So, so, so it, it's extremely important for all of our team, and we do this. I mean, we invest a tremendous amount every year in going up to Yakima and visiting with our hop purveyors, um, the growers, understanding how maybe the climate from season to season has changed the hops. And we've actually started to realize that we're starting to recognize certain areas or regions that we prefer over what other people may choose to buy. And this is something I think you're going to see more accentuated in the craft beer industry in the next several years as people really become maybe grower specific or regional specific. Well, we've become profile specific as to what we choose to do. And so we look for the oils to accentuate and express certain smells and aromas that we find exciting that we know that fits within our beers. Years ago, I used to say it was just me doing it. And now, I have found as a collective, right? I, I'm, I'm, I geek out sometimes on Star Trek, but the collective at Bear Republic is, as a group, we always find some synergy that creates, all right, that's, that's it. That's the flavor we're looking for. And when we don't have the opportunity to get that or we can't find it, boy, we have to blend them <coughs> together to get to that point. And I think we're not afraid to do that. Toughest thing for a brewer is repeatability. But when you do have that consistency of that collective, that's how we can do that every year. So hopefully that answered your question about oils because it's not a, num a, a numerological game, a, a numerical game that we choose to play, but we do know that the profiles fit within um, something we all agree on. Okay, so uh, if you could uh, kind of continue down that path, Danny would like to see if you could talk about the smells and the aromas that you're looking for, and also maybe talk about how the region has an impact and an effect on, on your beers. So, um, if you can, we can ask Daniel, is the region from where we get our hops from, or the region from, um, okay, for, for water? Okay, so we got asked a question about how that the regionality may affect what we're doing. And I, I think I think let, let's just let's just speak to hops. Yeah. You know, for uh, six years in a row, we selected our our centennials from from two growers in the Yakima Valley that were located within five miles of each other. This last year, for whatever reason, we selected we just absolutely fell in love with a centennial lot that was from Oregon. And so I think that I think when, when we're looking at hops, let's let's take Cascade. When we're looking at Cascade hops, we're looking for that 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 big citrus hit. We're looking for orange, tangerine, and really just a, that classic Cascade aroma. Um, and then this year we, we saw a Cascade that had kind of a, a, a spicy character, and we selected that just just to blend it in to see what that would do for us. Yes. But but it was it had all the characters we like plus something else. So. Um, you know, the territory, you know, we live in, in wine country. The, the territory uh, or the terroir of where the hops are grown certainly plays a big role. But I also think, you know, weather can shift that. So, you know, what was great in one region one year maybe, you know, shifted to another region. So um, it's really important we go up and, and, and look at what we're, what we're going to use. All right, great. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Daniel. All right. Hey, this is oh, no, it's just, we're excited. I don't know if we're the first to talk about it, but we definitely live in a region where um, we get I get asked regularly because I mean we we've got uh, God knows how many winemakers that live within the Russian River, Dry Creek, and Alexander Valley that come into our pub regularly, and those guys always want their in fact they pushed me for years to understand where things are coming from. So 
Um, I mean, my daughter's getting ready to start high school, and there's a farm to table class in her high school this year. I mean, that's that's how important yeah, terroir it, terroir yeah. is to this area. What I what I meant to first, I've heard it talked about a lot, but you actually know exactly what it means. I mean, number one, did I understand you to say that you have a core profile of hops? It's mm -hmm. the base profile for all of your beers, and the number two. You said you get all your hops from a specific region because they all tend to be together. Yes. So the answer to that is yes. And we've been, I credit my father with about 13 years ago pushing me to constantly think like a bigger brewer and understand where my base ingredients came from. And so it is something I look forward to every year going and meeting with growers, meeting with purveyors and understanding where our hops come from. I, I personally think within the next five to seven years, I'm going to own a home up in Yakima, just because I want to be that much closer to where where our hops are grown. So it's important. We grow hops for Bear Republic here in Sonoma County. We don't do it as well as they do in Yakima Valley, but we do it for our own knowledge and understanding of what can be done in the area. So. Well, I, I, I think you're... Your customers should know that those are two very interesting aspects and explain probably your success as a brewery. They're wonderful beers. And i got to tell you, I'm sorry I can't be there for the rebellion. That sounds like a great schooling on hops. Oh, it's, it, it's exciting because we've, we've actually been doing this for, <laughs> gosh, I want to say four years now. And we've it, it's gotten us enough credibility or notoriety where we're getting hops from literally all over the world where people will send us a small batch it'll have a number on it we brew it and and they're used to tasting it against other other hops and to the to the end where some of the some of the growers who are competitors that whole industry in the hop industry they don't mind getting something from something uh, somebody else because it gives them a flavor profile that they can start to understand I mean it's it's extremely, the hop industry, I just came from a hop convention, and the growers are just as much unified as the brewers in trying to understand what they do as special. And I, I think they're, they're just on the beginning of understanding their own renaissance, like what they, what they can start to do about understanding their terroir. And uh, it's exciting. Well, we've got an article coming up by Stan Hieronymus in the next issue that's just focused on that element of hops. It's really, it's really clear that that's one of the major axes that brewers like yours swing on. And, and you have a fabulous profile of beers. I've been telling you that for years. No, thank and you. Now I can see the three elements that have come together to create that. Um, so, no, you know, I'll, 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 get, I'll get out of the way and let your other customers talk. I'm just, <laughs> those, that's really great information. Well, it's, it's good, good hearing from you, and you know you're welcome anytime. I miss you being out here, so it's great to, great to hear from well, you. We'll just, we'll just get on the plane and come visit. That's very yeah. ridiculous being this far away. Hey, there, we've got a lot of great cheeses, wines, and you obviously know that people are starting to visit Sonoma County for beer now. So, okay, what, what's our next beer? The staff here is kind of thirsty. Oh well, you know what, we, Bear Republic is pushing. I shouldn't say pushing. Our newest racer. Like iteration is the Black Racer. Obviously, guys have started the up in the Pacific Northwest started this uh, whole Cascadian movement, and and it's kind of manifested itself into a Black IPA. So, look, everybody, my dad's very proud. I finally finished the label, and the best part about it is is that we've got a lot of medals that go with this beer, and it was a newer category. And so Black Racer, look for it. It's coming out here in the next, like, one to two months. So the label just got approved with, within a week. And um, I'm, I'm not going to tell you much about it except for just you got to try it. It's, it uh, is blazing trails for a newer category for Black IPA. Well, uh, if I could just interrupt, I do hope that uh, we will be getting samples here so that we can judge them appropriately. Yes, the answer is yes. I will, I'll make sure you get some. <laughs> so. And then at some point in time, I know it's a, it's a little is related to beer, but but uh, we've got a spirit we've been working on too, where we've got some whiskey in the pipeline. So if you come visit me here in California, I got some for you. All right? We just published an article on brewers that swing both ways. That'd be oh, wonderful. I, I that's 
it's kind of a new fun craft for Peter and I that we get to play, and we really feel it's an extension. But we have a hop flavored whiskey out there that's made with Racer Five. So. And again, isn't that now we're working on malt profiles when you're going whiskey to beer? Yes. Yes. That's more about how you're working the grain. It's it's the grain, but this is actually being sold and touted as a hop flavored whiskey. So you you can you can actually get the essence of the hops come through in the distillation process, which is I mean, I, I, you know what? I have the best job in the world. All right, Peter, and I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. so, we really do. Well, it's just another reason to get on the plane and get away from the East Coast yet. Yeah, you got it. It's nice. If you look outside today, it's actually gorgeous looking out on our patio today. So we love being California yeah, boys. Me, but we're freezing. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, I'm just meaning to, I keep meaning to get out and let your other customers talk. I'll, I'll catch up with you. Thanks. All right, cheers now. So we open a Big Bear? Yeah, let's go to right. Big Bear next. <laughs> What do we want to tell them about Big Bear? Big Bear, this is our entry into the stout world. And I need a new glass. Big Bear had its roots as a formulation of a uh, homebrew recipe I did for a friend of mine at Salsa Cycles. His name was Jeff Peel. He had a band, and the band was called Cement Head. And uh, the original recipe on this was based was called Cement Head Stout. And then... Uh, my mom didn't like that name. She didn't think it would go very well. So um, knowing that California had um, a bear as its logo and the name of the company was going to be Bear Republic, we called it Big Bear Black. And so cheers to Big Bear Black. Cheers. So you heard a little bit about this. It's got some uh, brown sugar, molasses, that creates a little bit of that sweetness on the back. But this particular beer also comes from that typical hopping profile of Centennial and Cascade. So years ago, this would have been considered an extremely hoppy um, stout. But as people's palates have kind of become more in tune with what's going on with uh, hoppy beers, we've started to see that this this particular beer, um, people are people are finding it. They're loving it when they get it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, got, it's got some residual sweetness from the molasses and the brown sugar, but it's, it's got a really nice dark bitterness uh, and that matches with, with sort of an espresso roasty character, and, but it, it's got the sweetness to back that up. And then, as Rich said, it's, it is quite hoppy for a stout, so you get the oil roll across the palate. And uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite beers that we make. It's, this is sort of a... A sleeper beer. This this has kind of a cult status. Uh, people that people that like stouts really tend to tend to love this beer. It's not one that you'll find everywhere in all of our markets. Partially because stouts, a lot of times, you know, they're specialized to the region or the, the brewery that's in that area. But if you do get to find it, it's one that ages very very well. I wouldn't have a problem as a brewer telling you to put one aside for a couple years and it would still taste really really good. Um, the the beauty of this one is is it gets used a lot. Um, when my friends will ask what's something that you could pair with food or make a recipe with, um, extremely goes well in the sauces or barbecue sauces. In fact, we, we blend this beer in a lot of the sauces that we use here at the pub. So we make a black and blue burger that has some of this beer in it. So And it also, because of that, sweetness goes extremely well with desserts. So cheesecake and Big Bear uh, is a great one. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, a, a stout ice cream float. Yeah, Big Bear is a... Uh, is a great one, which you can get here at the pub. I mean, we do it. We'll float a, you know, clover, vanilla ice cream on top of it, which is our local uh, dairy out here. Man, it's w wonderful. So I don't know what else to tell you except you just need to try it. And it's one of those beers from Bear Republic that you don't see a lot. So so please try it. Oh goodness, yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, one thing Bear Republic has been working uh, quite hard at, and uh, we're very proud of, is is our uh, wood and barrel age program. Um, we have about 100 barrels uh, that have are filled. Uh, we have two uh, fooders, which are wooden, wooden to French oak wooden tanks. They each hold 2,500 gallons. And over the next year, we have 19 releases of wood and barrel aged beers uh, coming down the pike. Some of them are going to be extremely limited. Uh, they'll be, you know, 20 case releases. Uh, we're working on a, a bottle and label package that will be, look really slick. 
Um, but some of these releases, like like Tartar coming out of one of our fooders, is a uh, Berliner Weiss. It's spontaneously fermented. It is, uh, it is a sour beer lover's dream. Extremely tart, very clean, uh, very clean lactic bitter uh, tartness, and it uh, is just a phenomenal beer. It's what, it's what, again, what, I just... I, I, when it's on tap, I, I don't really drink anything else. So this this barrel program has basically been in underfoot in the works for good three or four years, and and I think because of the concept of terroir where we live, we've really taken it to heart to try to understand what flavors could come from our region, where we're from, mm -hmm. and and one and one thing to mention about our barrel program is. Uh, you know our beers are they fermented with our with our with the exception of the spontaneously fermented beers they're fermented with our house ale yeast and then we do not buy any any bugs we don't buy any any pediococcus lactobacillus uh, any Britannomyces. all that all those critters come in with our natural air uh, we're we're in Sonoma County we're we're at a crossroads of, th of three different valleys uh, those valleys have grown you know prunes and pears and grapes for 120 years. So we have a really, really rich microflora, microfauna uh, in our area, and we we feel again tying into the terroir that that we talked about with hops. We feel that that you know we're not calling up you know uh, a local yeast supplier and saying hey send you know send blend number two. We're actually using the the bugs that are in our natural air to to create really, really multi-layered and complex flavors in our barrel-aged beers. And, at, and as this segment of the industry continues to grow, I think people are going to start to recognize maybe the regionality to it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to maybe even get the opportunity to define a little bit more about what each of the regions is choosing to do. That's that flavor that's from terroir. We, I, I think we're basically at an advantage to most of our competitors because of where we live. Now, we're both local boys. So you... you I was born and raised here. I'm I'm fourth generation. My kids are fifth generation. Peter's been here as long as me, and and we also were born and raised in the area. So we've got some extremely exciting, and I, and I hate to say it, but we started to do this really for us to understand what we were capable of doing outside of understanding yeast fermentation, because we we always are known for doing hoppy beers. But I, there's a there's a there's, there's going to be a really fun side to this that that. Um, really expands all the brewers here ability to create stuff. I mean we're playing with things like stone fruit, special things from the area. So um, we hope you look forward to seeing that stuff from us because it's going to be really exclusive. It's a really it's a really fun contrast. We work really hard to control the flavors of our house beers. It's really fun with these barrel aged beers just to let them do their own thing and and, and, and see what happens. So all right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank guys. you very and much. Cheers. Th thanks for joining us. Keep drinking craft beer. Yeah.